have you ever thought, how do I become a millionaire? We all have. And that's probably why you're watching this podcast. Well, today in our revisit series, we hear the story of how the founders of Snag Tights, Bree Reed and Tom Martin, made two million pound a month with just two laptops. In this episode, they share the embarrassing story that made them start Snag Tights, how they successfully used Facebook ads to sell their product and the power of empathy with your customers. Let's dive into it. Guys, thanks so much for coming on. Um, we have a really cool philosophy here, which is so simple. We believe that people, if they have a passion, they should pursue that passion and control their own destiny. And like the show says, they should back themselves. You are two people that I have known for a good deal of time. And I'm so pleased to see the most astronomical success that you've had doing exactly that. And now to the real talent in the room, Bree. Why don't you tell me what you're doing? Um, so we do something really simple, which is we sell tights to people who want to wear tights. And, Good market. You know, it's, it's, a, yeah. it's a simple thing, but tights historically haven't fitted. So 90% of women and probably a higher percentage of men can't find tights that fit. And we've redesigned tights. We changed them around. We've made them actually fun to wear, nice to wear, comfortable to wear and actually fit and stay up all day. So it's been a bit of a journey. So we've been trading 17 months and we've gone from zero to 1.8 million in 17 months a month, like 1.8 million a month. Not in total. Holy. It's a lot more in total. For, okay, right. <coughs> we need to dig straight into that. That is insane. Okay, right. So first of all, let's take a few steps back and start at the beginning here. So your background, I you're not a tights designer by trade that's not your background where, where we what is your where are you what did you do before um so i used to run businesses and do marketing for high growth businesses okay but lifetime tights wearer lifetime tights of passionate <laughs> about the product until i couldn't find tights that fit at all anymore so you know that was a, a bit of a turning point i've got a um i've got a theory here that we that every business starts with one of two sentences wouldn't it be better if, or wouldn't it be cool if, like, wouldn't it be cool if Tom and I could start a boy band, or wouldn't it be better if I could wear tights that didn't fall down? Now, you had a particular story, an experience, which made you jump into this, right? Yes. So um, I was walking down the street um, called George Street in Edinburgh, which is a very fancy pants shopping Lovely, street. Lovely, I know it. Yeah. Um, and everybody there is all dressed the nines and is all very judgy. And I was walking down the street and my tights fell off um, and okay. they, kept, they kept falling down and I kept trying to pull them up and eventually there came a point where I knew I wasn't going to be able to pull them up anymore so I had to take my shoes off and then I had to take my tights off and then in my head I went oh I bet nobody saw that turned around and there were like a hundred people watching me oh my goodness um, and then I went on to talk to my friends about this because it's one of those embarrassing moments that if you, you don't just, forget you didn't talk about yeah. would just like chew your insides and you would turn into some kind of like self-hating devil um, I talked to loads of women about it and it turned out it wasn't just me that everybody couldn't find tights that fit and everybody thought it was them and not the tights that were wrong so everybody thought they had a weird body or it was, you know, their shape that tights didn't fit. And actually it was tights that were broken, not the people. I love that. So you basically just, and it's something that, look, as a complete tight-based moron, I, or general moron, I had, I, it's not a problem that I thought was a thing. Like you see people hoiking all the time and you sort of look at it and think, oh, well, that's tights. That's what people have to do. But you were like, no, there's something more to this that I can fix this problem. So what was that first step that you did? You're like, okay, do you know what? Fuck this. I'm going to go fix this problem. What do you do first? So I went and I bought all the tights that I could find. So I bought all the M&S tights, all the Primark tights, every shop that I could get to, put them all together and tried to work out why they didn't fit. And Just you personally, just like you just yeah. do your own yeah. research. Um, and then, you know, measured a whole lot of them, tried to understand it and worked out that basically the width of all of the tights was the same. So they just varied in length. So the width, the of, width the, of the an extra, extra, extra the small pair. Yeah. And an extra, extra, extra large pair were the same. The, so, the waist was the same size? Yeah, it was the same yeah. size. So no wonder it doesn't fit anyone. So. so the assumption is that all women have the same size waist and they just vary by length of leg. Because obviously that's how people are constructed, right? Yes. Wow. I did not know that. How insanely stupid. Yeah. So, and that was basically the fundamental. There's some other things that we did to tights as well, but the main one is that we changed 
the width of the tights. So it's the width of the thigh and the leg all the way through, as well as then the waist. So they fit different size people. So they fit very small people better. They fit larger people better. And fit tall people better. Tall people better, short people better. You know, everyone that isn't a, you know, five foot ten size eight, which is probably the 10% of people that don't have problems with their tights. I think I am that size. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So for a size I'm easily a six. Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't. Okay. So that's that. And so that's really great. So you did that and you figured out this problem. But what do you do next? You can't be like, okay, fine. I mean, do you, how do you go about you going and building your own tights? Well, you start to find, you know, you start to talking to manufacturers, understanding why tights can't be built differently and all sorts of things like that. And eventually found, you know, people that had, you know, the ability to create tights which would fit differently and it took about two years to get to that point of researching it and finding the right people and eventually got there and then you know so, so no nobody makes their own tights anymore so so the last brand that made their own tights was pretty poly um, based in the midlands and they went out of business in 2016 so, so all tights now wherever you buy them from are bought from third-party manufacturers who are either in italy poland turkey or china that's really interesting. I think what's really beautiful about that story, I think, is that <clears throat> there's nothing like most people will go into that scenario and be like, certainly as I was before we started having this conversation, be like, I don't know anything about tights. There's literally no way that I could open a tights company. But you were like, well, neither did you. But nothing. But if, to be there's fair, no I think I know everything about everything. <laughs> so like that is that is true. We did have a conversation off air about quizzing. And I could feel your confidence. Um, but there is, no, but you're in this situation where I think I love that you should have the confidence to be like, well, I don't know, but I can learn it. Everything that you are have in your brain right now has been learned at some point. So how is this any different? Mm -hmm. And I love that you said, well, actually, let's find out the inconsistencies. Let's find out what the problems are. Let's go and fix it. I love that attitude. But then you're at that point where you're like, I've, well, so you've sort of, you've done your market validation first, didn't you? Like you were texting your mates and being like, well, is anyone else having this problem? You find out why that problem's there. And then you're like, well, let's go and find someone to build this mm. now. So that means you're getting a product down pat. I bet that didn't happen straight away. Yeah, so we, we had some people that were trying the product. So we, we tried it on with all our products. We fit them on real people. Wait, so, so you wait, so you found a manufacturer who made your, your design. Yeah. Okay. And you got some of your mates to try these on, test yeah. them out, just like basic focus group stuff. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, and actually they were they were quite right quite quickly, so there wasn't a lot of issues around them. But mm -hmm. still now we test everything on real people. So, you know, you can test it on a mannequin, you can test it, they have these big pairs of fake legs that you can get. But we always find it's best to have them on a real person well, and get course. real feedback. Yeah, so, exactly, yeah. So we still test in exactly the same way. I love Tom's that. our size D tester. Size D. Size D. Yeah. D for devil. D Delicious. For comes after C and before E. Yeah. Okay, fine. Yeah. Okay, less exciting than I expect, yeah. expected. Okay, fine. D for Delta, I guess. Yeah. Okay, we'll work on it. We'll, it. we'll work. We'll work. We'll work on a cooler name. Okay, so if you so you you run through that testing process, how long did that take from you've had that incident to you've got your product? It's about about two two years. A little bit longer than that. Could you both work? Yeah, about, about 18, 18 months. Yeah, something like yeah. that. And you and you and Tom, you were. Uh, I mean, you, you're a, you're a techie. I mean, I know you as being. A, I, I think that's a very generous interpretation. You describe it. yourself as an architect, but not that kind of architect. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. No, no, no one that knows anything about tech. So. I don't know where to go with that. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, so, and, but you two met each other and you were like, look, and I, and I know that before you guys were running a, a, a digital marketing yeah. agency. That was kind of your background. That was your bread and butter. Um, and I imagine this, you were a bit like, well, actually, I've got the two, I can solve the two problems here. I've got a product and traction is going to be the hard bit. But you're like, well, actually, I've already got that bit down pat, which is, I often think is the harder part of the puzzle. So what happened next? And I, I know how this particular story ends and I, I'm looking forward to hearing about it. Oh, this is your, well, all the website in two hours in a pub. Well, so, so we found a product and, and we raised a bit of money. So we raised about 100,000 um, for like set up and, and initial this is your fr friends and family and yeah, like yeah, that, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, like Bree's friends and family because my friends and family don't have 100 grand lying around. Um, and then we kind of got to a point where we were kind of putting everything off. So we 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 were planning the photo shoot for ages, but it wasn't quite happening. We weren't making it happen. 
Um, we had the product, the product was lined up to go, the fulfillment was lined up to go. But just just taking that final step is like a big scary thing. So, I can so, kind of, so many people can relate to kind that. Kind of like found we were procrastinating on it. And in the end, we just went, right, it's the middle of March, we're gonna launch before the end of March. So we set up a photo shoot in two weeks. Um, well, I, I found um, the most awesome producer of photo shoots mm -hmm. in about two days who then set up a photo shoot. How, did you, how did you find them? Um, Google. Like Google, yeah. Um, but we got, we got, so actually we found the photographer um, that we wanted because this was a guy who specialized in like sort of plus size photography and, and didn't just do, do skinny people. And it was his manager. Um, awesome lady called Jess Guest, who I recommend for anyone who needs a photo shoot organizing. Shout out to Jess Guest. Um, who, who just arranged everything, like, like sorted out all the other talent, sorted out the location, made everything happen on the day, it was just incredible. So we did photo shoot in two weeks, and then we did the photo shoot on the Tuesday. On the Thursday, we started getting the images, and we were like, right, okay, probably need to build a website now, because we're, what, four days away from the end mm. of the month, which was our deadline. Wait, so, so, so four days away yep. from launch, you've yep. got no website. Correct. And you're a brand-led business. Yep, correct. So then uh, we were in the Victoria Bar and Grill. Victoria Bar Which, and Grill. Again, shout out to the Victorian Bar and Grill. Great I place. love that place. Yeah. Absolutely. Great sports coverage, like all the sports channels. Mm -hmm. Always a good place to sit. Breakfast is amazing. Yeah, breakfast is awesome. Where is um, it? It's Victoria, in Victoria Station. Station. Oh, at Victoria Station. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so easily accessible. <laughs> so we're there. Um, and I was like, we should really start working on the website. Then Brie um, had like a little domestic like drama going on and, and went off on the phone. And she came back about two hours later, and I was like, I'll finish the website. Yeah. And, and that's so we the went, website we and, used today. And so we went live. Yeah. That simple. Yeah. You had all, I mean, great. <laughs> great. Not a lot of people can, can say the same. Um, but uh, if it doesn't work out, your web design services are available. But, but it was, it's, so all, what was your, okay, so, okay, being serious, what was your strategy when you were building that website? Because, like, if something takes you two hours to do, it sounds like it's going to be rubbish. But I know from seeing the website, it's not. So you must have thought to yourself, like, what am I trying to achieve here? What do I need this to do a so, little bit so, before? So the strategy was not to put anything on there that isn't required for people to buy the tights. So at this point, we've got four colors in six Love sizes, that. right? Because well, somebody challenged you and said, you can't have a one-page website. You can't buy directly off the first well, page of a website. And yeah. You went, that's not true. And then yeah. you built one. Why on earth not? Exactly. Yeah. So, why, why, so if that's all we've got, why am I going to make you look at one page and then go, oh, would you like to come and see another page? Would you like to click through? Would you like to click through? Why? Just like we're a tights company. Here's some pictures of people's in tights. Here's our product. Would you like to buy our tights? Something really brilliant about this. Like there's a real consistency to both of your attitudes, which I really love which is a philosophy which I think that perpetuates with you, and I've always experienced it when speaking with you, is that you, you're you just like, why is it that way? Why do I have to do it that way? Why can't it be a different way? I think there's something in that about <clears throat> that's probably what's led to your success is that you're constantly questioning. You're always saying like, well, you have to have multiple pages. Why the fuck do I have to have multiple pages? Types of shit. Why do they have to be shit? You know, why do I? I, I imagine when people said, "Oh, you need to have a huge range, or you have to have millions of colors, and you, all this stuff." You're probably like, "Fuck you!" I just why? Yeah, and it and it worked, right? Yeah. So you had that two days, two days before launch. You're there. Four, cool. I'm sorry, I exaggerated. Um, and so four days from launch, yeah. you go websites up. How do you launch? We launched. What well, does that just, mean? Then we decided just to launch that day because like the website was ready. <laughs> so you did it early. Yeah, yeah, so so, so, in so, history. I, so I, I showed Bree the website. Do you like the website? Website's fine. So we put the website live. So at that point, anyone can go on the website and buy. Or no one is going to. Because well, no one knows. we thought. But then this lady, <laughs> well, no, because then you did your magic with the Facebook ads. Yeah. So then we made some, Bree made some Facebook ads, put them live. And we got our, so we did that about eight o'clock. Yeah. Eight, nine o'clock we finished. And we had the first genuine proper order from a real person we didn't know 11 o'clock that evening book of eleanor book the of book eleanor. of eleanor yeah. the hero of oh, snag tights yeah. 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 so that's that's fascinating so you had the, the the sort of the key traction point there now look you've got a great product you've got a website you know the mentality and the psychology of your customers so once they get on that page you're winning them and you're converting them you thought that bit through thoroughly let's not underestimate how important that is but then you're getting in front of people now 
the first time you were ever described to me by my good friend Tom here many years ago was he said, I'm working with this girl who can do some black magic on <laughs> on Facebook. I misunderstood what he meant. But now I see that it is genuinely, genuine sorcery. So what did you do that was so different? And what tips do you have for people about making that that works so effectively, so quickly. And also like you didn't have huge budget either. So it's, it's about, really it comes down to having a conversation with people. So, you know, there are just people and there's you and you're talking to them and you need to do that in the most effective way possible. You need to do it in a way that's engaging. You need to listen to what they say back to you. And that's really the only difference. So, you know, you put an ad out there and the picture of the person looks like the person that's viewing the ad, you know, it's written in a tone of voice that they get and that they understand. And when they click through, they actually get to an easy to use, you know, easy to understand website. And it's all about making it simple for them. And if they comment on it and go, you know, well, I hate this ad or, you know, that shit or anything like that, you go, oh, right, sorry, didn't realize that. We'll change that. And thank you for your feedback. And we still answer every single comment we get on every single ad, on every single Instagram post, on every Facebook post. Anybody that writes to us in any way, we comment back on because we listen to it all. We're so famous now. We get letters. We got, we we get got letters. an actual letter yeah. from a lovely lady the other day. Um, had she seen the WI thing? Yeah. yeah so we, we did um, uh, an advert in the WI magazine. And this lady sent us a lovely letter mm. and she sent us a check, bless her, because she'd seen the ads, didn't have a computer, didn't know how to order online, so she sent us a check yeah. and said, please, can I have some tights? Yeah. So we sent her some tights. High five to that woman. I Amazing. Know, right? I love that. How incredible. So that's, I mean, so wonderful. So I love that that mentality that it's a conversation. And then something you said there that I think is really fascinating is you had an image of your the person you were speaking to effectively the same type of person in the image which is so funny because like you think about how other people do it like if you look at an advert for a gym like they've got you know like an adonis on the poster when the people who are going to the gym it's a really tiny percentage of people who have that or like if you look at you know um <clears throat> well anything like clothing brands and so forth they, they give you obviously that aspirational figure but like you know, you sort of go in there and you feel like, well, that's not me. That's not how I dress. You know, it's, um, I love that. And I can absolutely see why that resonated with people. Because a lot of people find, I don't know, you probably know more about this, but I think a lot of people find buying clothes quite an intimidating process. Because you're like, I'm not a stylish guy, right? And you feel like you're getting no it wrong. There. What's that? No argument there. Uh, thanks for that time. Really appreciate that. You're the no one people... with, the, with the buckles on your shoulders. Well, you're, you're the one who turned up for a first date looking like that. <laughs> <laughs> that burn again. Okay do and we did a, a survey recently about it and i don't have the exact stats but people were saying you know shopping in shops has driven them to absolute tears like a huge percentage of people because it's just it's hard to find stuff that fits you you feel intimidated when you work walk in yeah we've had people talk to us about how they feel like they're being bullied by clothes brands you know that you've got these you have to look this way to wear my clothes and my clothes are not for you or people mm. like you yeah which is a form of bullying right you're but, like but book of eleanor um yeah. who, who remains a lot of support of the brand um we did we did an instagram post because we were we've gone out for more investment and, we, and we, we did an instagram post said to our customers yeah what would what would you if you were us and you were going for investment what would you say to investors about the brand mm. And, and Booker Eleanor came back saying she felt like clothing brands hated her. Yeah. She literally felt like they were deliberately trying to marginalize her and mm. humiliate her and make her life a misery. And then when Snag came along, she was like, finally, this is someone who actually wants me to have nice, comfy clothes I can wear. Yeah. But you think about what that says about an industry that someone can you know, go through their life feeling like, that industry actively hates her. That's her That's her retail experience. I think that's fascinating. And from a business perspective, something you said there is absolutely inspired. You asked your customers how they would describe their experience of working before you for your pitch deck. What better way so to, to send articulate the problem? investors straight to the Instagram feed with, you know, that they commented I said, on. look at what people are saying about this us. Is, this is what people want I love to that transparency. Us. More people should have that courage to do that. Like, and if you're, because they're your, they're your customers, they're your advocates. I love that. How quickly did it grow from that moment? So you've got that, you've gone through the Facebook ads. I know you had quite accelerated success, but how quickly did it grow? What kind of numbers did we see there? 
first order at 11 o'clock yeah. on the first night or minus four so, as it was I mean I, it's it's interesting because you you go through this series of plateaus so so first order 699 one pair of tights 699 and then you start to get a few more and we were happy with like 50 quid if you made 50 quid in a day that was like you know 10 orders and you're, you're ecstatic so you go through the first month and you're looking for 50 quid and then you have your first 100 pound day um, and then you kind of get used to that and then you're starting to set different milestones so it was like I think 10,000 in a week was really the first big wow. psychological how, which how, we did how, how soon was that? Three, four months in? Yeah. 10,000 in a week? Yeah. Cause yeah. It, I mean, four months in, 10,000 yeah. in a week. Yeah. Gee, and wow. then, and then, And then you kind of, you, it, but it just graduates. So as soon as you get to 10,000 in a week, you're like, we want 50,000 in a week. That took a bit longer. So what's that? 200K. Do you remember when it was six months in? Yeah. 50,000 in a week. And then now we're 17 months in and it's 50,000 in a day. Yeah. Which is just crazy. You get fifty thousand orders. No, fifty thousand pounds. pounds a day. Fifty thousand pounds a day. More than right. that. So, so, so we're doing about three thousand orders a day. So three thousand orders a day. And how soon? That how long's Snag been going? Seventeen months. Seventeen months, and you're getting three thousand orders a day. That is eye-wateringly successful. That I don't even know how to deal with that. I can't even compute how successful that is. And I think you. What's really interesting there is you say about these continual plateaus and new targets. So are you just relentlessly trying to win new business, but also keep your existing customers? Like your churn rate, I imagine, is quite low because you you have a great product. Yeah, so we've got about a 70% repeat rate. So 70% of people that buy product. For I don't know about again. the market. Is that high? It's incredibly yeah. high. Okay, what would be so like industry standard? 10%, something like that. So it's, it is really, really high. So And what's that down to? because the product works yeah sure and okay. you know people like it and well, the, the, pro the product works and also tight as, as a wear out as an item a, a they wear out but b it's the kind of thing you can have 20 pairs of so yeah so as, we add, as we add in more colors people will buy more mm. you know, same customers will come back buy more colors because then they've got different options with their wardrobe so it's inherently a multi-purchase product um, yeah sure commodity that makes, that makes sense. Yeah, sure. you know you, you yep. buy thinner ones for the summer or you buy chubba for the summer so um, once you once you're selling a quality product to customers who previously couldn't get a product they were satisfied with, of course they're going to be loyal. Of course they're yeah. going to keep coming back. We so many of our customers like, on a daily basis we will get messages from people saying, "I had given up wearing skirts and dresses because I couldn't get tights that fit." And you get people who say, "I haven't worn skirts or dresses for twenty years, thirty years, forty years, 40 years like, like literally," and they're like, "You have changed my life." Because now they can wear all these different clothes. Now they feel completely different. It's just extraordinary what the difference between a good fitting product and a bad fitting product makes. I like that. It's something. That, yeah, there's, I think there's, there's definitely something key there in that if you can get people to emotionally engage with what you're selling, and you really are, that there is a real connection to building that confidence again to wear the clothes I, I you see, want. I, I genuinely think that's the wrong way around. Oh, you to do? Look at it. Okay. So, because you just said, if we can get people to emotionally engage with what we're selling, it's not that. If you okay. can sell something that people will be emotionally engaged by. Do you know, uh, do, no, no, do yeah, see, yeah. I know you're right. You're right. No, I agree with you. I'm wrong. That's absolutely the right way to look at it. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. Yeah, I agree. We're, we're just selling tights. Mm. But it's the fact that people can't, our tights fit. Our brand represents them, whereas previous brands don't, previous tights don't fit. That's what makes the emotional connection. It's not really anything we're doing around the emotion of it. It's their lived experience to that point is that tight brands hate them. Mm. And then we come along and we just, we don't hate them. We actually quite like them. I and we give them, <laughs> we give them good products. No, I love that. And so you, and you, you continuing to grow, obviously, at quite a serious rate. And you talk about plateaus. So what what is what is the factors that you focus on as a business to try and move you to the next level? Is it bringing in new regions? Because I bet that there's no market in the world where people don't wear tights, right? Like everybody has legs. Yeah. 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 I think when we talk plateaus, so far it's not been a plateau of demand. It's been a plateau of the ability to supply. 
So we've run right. out of product. Yeah. We've, um, and you guys aren't supply chain specialists. This isn't your game, right? So, no, so we're learning a lot very, yeah. very quickly. Um, we're in a much better situation now, but we ran out of um, product basically entirely for six weeks. Um, wow. How do you deal with that? That must be tough. It was hard. Um, and, you know, dealing with the customers through that period that want to buy tights and we don't have any and just being really um, transparent with them and explaining what had happened and when we were going to get stuff back in stock and how that all worked was really important. But you get the plateaus we've had have been about, you know, supply and constraints around being able to dispatch enough product, you know, all of those things. Um, in terms of demand, we still see an absolute linear upward, you know, curve in terms mm. of we spend and, you know, more people want to, you know, want to have tights that fit. And the market for hosiery is massive. It's $38 billion. Wow. So, wow. you know, we think we've grown a lot, but $38 billion and 90% of people say that the product doesn't fit them. Yeah, I mean, that's... I mean, it's just a huge yeah, market. It's, it's, it's the right time. So, <laughs> yeah. you know, there's, there's a lot more scope I in mean, there. I, I think, for, for me, the key thing is looking at your acquisition costs. So, so our acquisition cost is coming down over time. Now, what that says is we're not even getting close to um, to hitting the limits of demand. So every every plateau we've ever had has been related to supply. If your acquisition cost starts to go up, then you can start to say, right, it's getting more expensive for me to find people who, who engage with the brand who are willing to buy. Maybe there's more competition, whatever, whatever. But as long as the acquisition cost is is level or coming down, that means we, we aren't anywhere near being constrained by demand. It's all about our ability to fulfill that demand. Yeah, and you'll, you'll be modest about it, but I know you two are both incredibly uh, sort of data-driven people. You both come from a background of mining data and complex things like that. And I imagine that probably must help you with being relentless with your making sure your acquisition costs are right and you're getting it in the right market and getting the right people and also for supply chain. It's got to be hugely beneficial for you guys. So what's next? What's the next big thing for Snag other than now you are officially the best entrepreneur in the universe? Isn't that the title you just won for Barclays or something like that? Oh, I wish someone would give me that one. That would be really good. We'll make one on the show. Yeah, yeah no, we'll, make really on the show. we'll make one on the show. Yeah. Exactly. Although Tom and I shared it last year. Yeah. Yeah. What is it? What is it going to be? <laughs> what did uh, you win? So we won Startup Entrepreneur of the Year. Boom. So, and yeah. a big name, Barclays thank, as well. Thank you, Barclays. Yeah. Thank you, Barclays. Yeah. And thank you to Trevor McDonald for doing such a great job of uh, of presenting the award. Sir Trev, well. big man. Yeah. Just amazing. He's great. Yeah. Fantastic. So what? Yeah. So what's the next? What's the next thing for you guys? What's the next step? Well, Germany. This Germany. 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 Germany's yeah. the one. No. So 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 we've done. So we we expanded internationally nine months ago. Yeah. Started selling internationally. Uh, Australia is going really well. Yeah. Austra again, th things that you don't expect. Didn't really expect Australia to be as as strong a, a market as it is, but that's going really, really well. Also, snag means sausages there, yeah. which they seem to find adorable. Yeah. So. <laughs> I love yeah. that. I love that. I, and I have sausage legs, so I can see why. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Got so it. show your snags means a very different thing on <laughs> Australian Instagram. Yeah. Um, and it also means sausage dog. Yeah. So that was the other thing. We, we we had like an Instagram feed, which was basically tight, 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 sausage dog. Sausage tight, dogs. tight, tight, sausage dog. Mm. Um, Brilliant. Uh, but yeah, so, so we've been international for about nine months. America's just just in its infancy, but, but looking good. But we're about to launch our first non-English website. So we are wow. going German. Strumpfhosen. 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 Yeah. yeah. Is that's that the is word that, is, of the month? Is that snag in? No, that's tight. tight. Oh, tight. tight. So, so snag. Yeah. So snag. Strumpfhosen. Yeah. I'm yeah. in. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that's exciting. So we've never done it. So yeah. everything Apparently has to Germany's be. Germany's the second biggest tights market in the yeah. world after so, uh, the US. After the US, I didn't. Now that's an interesting fact for anyone who takes away this from the show. It's um, important to know. But yeah, I mean, that means like customer service emails in German, everything in German. So going into Are you setting up operation there? Have you got someone over here who's no, a native no, speaker? Still, still going to like fulfill it out of the same place. So, so we so do just everything dispatch virtually. from here, but it just means interact, having that conversation with German customers <coughs> fully in German end to end. Fine. There's one thing now I want to pick up on before we get to the final bit of the show. Um, and you just touched on it really quickly there. Your business model is quite interesting because you're. Like, you don't really have an office. No, we don't have an office. You're basically a laptop. <laughs> a series we're, of laptops. We're phones? a digital business. We're yeah. a digital native e-commerce business. Yeah. Which is just incredible. For you guys to have 
3,000 orders a month, 50,000 pounds a day. A day, sorry, a day, sorry, my bad, a day. And you are basically operating via your laptops and your phone, and that's it. Yeah. So without WhatsApp, you couldn't do it. I, I think we WhatsApp need to give a shout out yeah, to WhatsApp. WhatsApp I, I don't know cute. how anyone did anything before WhatsApp, but. You are, in many ways, a tech business. Yes, I think and we are, yeah. Yes, and no, because I think that's our, our entire or, or most of our business is technology, it happens through technology. Mm. So we take payments from people in Australia through technology, we send orders to you know warehouses through technology, they get dispatched. We never see the orders, they get dispatched to people um, through technology. It's all you know, it's a, it's a but none of that is stuff we've written. It's amazing what is out there in the ecosystem that you can just go, right, I need an e-commerce platform, right, I'll go to Shopify. The reason we could build a website in two hours is because Shopify is so awesome. You go, I would like a theme for my shop, or here's one, which is one page. I've got some images, put my images on, put my product in, done, two hours, and you're up and running. And, and it's not, I did no coding, I did nothing, that wasn't me because I'm some super tech god. Anyone can build a website in two hours on Shopify. Mm -hmm. And then when you get to sort of the courier stuff, there's we've got an off-the-shelf order management system, integrates with Shopify, integrates with couriers on the back end, handles all of the label printing, everything like that. Again, off the shelf, it's a cloud service, you pay per month, no servers, no IT department, no, you know, backup tapes mm. or anything like that. Because we're living in an awesome internet age. So we're at the end of the pod where we ask for your wisdom specifically to take away for people who are in a similar position to you. But I'm going to do it slightly differently this time because there's two areas that I am particularly interested to hear about. One is, what is your advice, Brie, for people who are doing that that social advertising, that Facebook campaign, the Instagram campaigns? What, what led you to be so much more successful than where other people have been? And Tom, for you, someone I know who is particularly anti-authority for everything or being told what to do, how do you deal with the fact that being a digital business, you are never away from it? It's good that you've got it, but you're constantly being, you're always needing to respond and deal with that particular thing. So your freedom is being kind of taken away, but also given to you. So we'll cover that in a second. But firstly, Bree, tell me, what is your advice to people to make those campaigns successful? The biggest thing that people don't do with Facebook campaigns that they should is test. So, you know, you have the ability to have 50 different ads in every ad set. If you're not testing 50, 50 different ads every single time, you're wasting opportunity. So, you know, we max out every single ad set we can possibly get with all sorts of different creatives, with different imagery, with different text, with different formats. And as you go through that, you start to understand what ones work better and then you reiterate those ones again with more variants. So it's a continual improvement methodology to Facebook ads. And if you keep doing that, you get to a better and better position as well as reading all of the comments that you get on them, looking at your relevancy scores, looking at the amount that Facebook is actually finding the ads to be successful. And from that, you can start to create some really great campaigns at scale. And then it's also making sure that you're monitoring all of the metrics. So as soon as they go off the boil, you're able to refresh, restart, create a new campaign that will then take the majority you know, of the spend of the last one to, to do it consistently or to increase your actual audience size again. So we don't do a huge amount of um, super targeted ads because I don't think they really work in the algorithm anymore. So it's all about being wide and letting people's behavior dictate what they get as opposed to, you know, trying to go, oh, I want a lady called Sue who's, you know, aged between 24 and 30 who likes sausage dogs. You know? Actually, I do know that woman and she, she is a tight buyer, but yeah. it's irrelevant now. Yeah. yeah. I mean, That's, I, carry on, yeah. I think, having, having watched Breed do this for, for like nearly two years, I... My view is people massively over mythologize Facebook ads. So, so basically, if you break down what Brie does with Facebook ads, she makes ads that are really clear about what they're selling. So you have a picture of the product, 
then you have some words that this is the product it costs this much it's a nice product i mean very there's no sort of super complex copy or anything like that. it's just be extremely clear to people what the product is what it does why it would make their life better and then you target it but again we will go out we started out we've run campaigns to women for for snacks so you start at a super broad level and then when this when you find stuff that doesn't work you follow the data and when you find stuff that doesn't work you turn it off and that's all she does there isn't like some sort i've read you know blog articles where people are going oh if you launch your campaigns in a new business manager at exactly three minutes past midnight, I've genuinely no, I genuinely read an article like this. Going at exactly three minutes past midnight, you get like a super boost from the algorithm, and it makes people buy. And you're like, the Facebook algorithm doesn't buy anything. It doesn't make people do anything. It shows ads to people, and if your ad is crap, people won't buy from it. If your website is crap. People won't buy from it. But I think, moreover, is if your product is crap, people yeah. don't buy, right? There's this belief that, you know, Facebook ads will sell anything and people think that they can go out there with any product and, you know, put a couple of Facebook ads out and they'll be able to sell them. And it's like, if the product you start with is crap, you're not going to be able to sell it at all. Mm. And, you know, you see quite a lot of people that go, you know, it'll take at least a month, two months before you see your final results on your Facebook ads before you'll know if it works or not doesn't i mean you know whether or not it's going to work in 24 hours i mean yeah. and if it's not going to work you know eventually you need to go it's your product it's not you know it's not you and at the agency we had to one particular time we had to do that to a company and say look you know guys like we're doing everything right here but you know it's it's not going to work because your product isn't isn't good and you know unless you change that there's no marketing in the world that's going to be able to save it you know yeah that's that's really fascinating. And again, it comes back to that data-driven approach to something and just being absolutely relentless in just looking for the truth. Okay. Thank you. I can take a lot of, take, it's actually got my, my brain going wild thinking about that. Um, and Tom, the question for you, how how do you deal with the that dichotomy where you have the 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 freedom of being entirely digital, you work when you want, but at the same time, the trapping of never really being offline? Stop looking at it. I mean, I mean, it's, yeah. I, I, I don't. For me, I, I, I could never go and work for anyone else again. I could never work in any kind of structured environment again. I could, I struggle. I would struggle to work in an office, even that we ran, in terms of you've got to be in this place forty hours a week. You work when you work when you feel it. When you're not feeling it, you walk away from it. You put your phone down. It'll be there when you come back to it. Um, I mean, I think probably it's worse for people who work with us, particularly me. So Brie keeps pretty sociable hours. She doesn't get up till about 11 if she's given the choice. But anyone who works for me is waking up and there's like 500 WhatsApp notifications because I've got up at six in the morning and being like, oh, we need to do this and we need to do this and we need to do this and we need to do this. I'm sorry, when was the last time you got up at six in the morning? Uh, that may, may have changed. <laughs> but, it depends yeah. which time zone. Um, but like weekends, like like there is. I mean, I mean, it, there's, there's there's genuine trade offs to this. So so the people who work for us don't have to come to an office. They don't have to get dressed. And you know, we don't monitor the hours they work. But we're going to be messaging you Saturday, Sunday if that's what's important. And and if it's something important, we're going to expect you to respond. And I think it genuinely comes down to either that works for you as as a lifestyle, as a way of working, and you embrace it. Or it doesn't, and you need very, you know, some people I think need that that segmentation to be able to go, I am in work now, and then switch off and go, oh, I'm out of work. When I had, when I had a normal job, um, I'd still be thinking about it. You know, I'd, I'd think about it at home. I'd spend, you know, when I was thinking about it, I was thinking about it. It didn't matter. And then I'd go to work and I'd think about like football or ancient history or yeah. yeah i could spend eight hours sitting in an office environment and contribute nothing to anything related to the work so yeah i think it's just personality type no yeah i get it and i think it's good advice i think the, the point i take away from that is like you just got to pick the right style that works for you like and if you do it if you start your own company and you work like that you got to accept that like work needs to be there isn't a timetable if you want that freedom if you if it means working on a saturday it's just another day yeah. I think it is giving yourself permission. So I okay. I don't have um, email notifications. So I turned them off like two years ago. And 
Email, I'll do when I'm in an email mindset and I won't look at it any other time. WhatsApp, I keep notifications on so that, you know, I can be involved in all of the direct stuff that we have. I know if there's an emergency, someone will WhatsApp me about yeah. it. And yeah. I think then you have the, you know, you need to put some I don't know, techniques in place that work for you. Like if I got notification for every email I get, I would go insane. Um, yeah. So it's, it, you know, th- it's about the way you the do it. The other thing, um, and I'm going to go a little bit techie here, is that we have become entirely asynchronous in our communications. So both of us now, point blank, will not answer the phone. No. And will not respond to voicemails. No. And when I th- again, when I think back to my normal job, I was super synchronous. If someone rang me, I'd be on it because the whole point of my job was communicating with those people and looking like I was busy. Mm-hmm. So being on the phone, I, I, I would be on the phone eight hours a day. Um, and it looked like I was busy. Mm-hmm. Whereas now, because you're not interested in looking busy, you look interested in getting stuff done. Someone ringing you is like the least efficient way to get anything done. You're going to consume 10 minutes of my life. I'm going to have to say hello. I'm going to ask how your kids are. We're going to have a little chat about the weather. Eventually, you're going to get around to the point. You're going to beat around the bush. Then I'm going to have to, I'm an R because I haven't, because you've just blindsided me with it. I have no idea what you're going on about. So I, then I'm going to have to like extemporize while I think of an answer. Then you're going to discuss it some more. Or you could send me a one line WhatsApp message. I'll have a think about it. I'll get back to you. Yeah. Yeah. No, I agree. No, great guys. I mean, Nick, it's you you blow my mind i've i've really enjoyed this time and you your your attitude of looking at the data quest constantly questioning why thinking this can be done better and then changing it you are evidence of that wonderful sort of <clears throat> movie style um notion of look all you need is a laptop and an idea and you can create a successful business you've absolutely delivered on that i wish you guys every luck going forward and i'm sure we're going to be hearing more from you every single day thanks very much Thank Thank you. You.